the title for today is Three Days and Three Nights. Now, for many years, I thought that this didn't make, it wasn't that important. Even though I couldn't fit three days and three nights into Friday to Sunday morning. Because the best I could get was uh, two nights. And then a day and a bit. Because Friday, apparently, according to the Roman Catholic Church that has set it in place, this is why, where all the tradition comes from, the crucifixion happened on the Friday, which means that if the, Jesus had died late Friday afternoon, there was only about three hours or so left in the day before he had to be placed in the tomb. And then if he had ro risen before daylight on Sunday, it means that there was only one full day in the grave. Now, I'm going to get to exactly how what the Bible says rather than what we begin to believe. You know, I kind of want to bring this into line with uh, Christmas and the fact that uh, Jesus on all the Christmas little Christmas cards, we have Jesus in, in the manger. And we have all the shepherds stood around and the wise men, they are all there in the manger along with Jesus. And all celebrate that uh, as the truth. It is, it's become a gospel. And then you all of a sudden one day read that how is it possible that Jesus was visited by the, these magi, the, these guys, important scientists at his home? Wasn't it at the manger? And all of a sudden there's confusion. <coughs> purely because we believe the Christmas card instead of the Word of God. Now, here yeah, it's very much the same when we look at the Passover. And we are very deliberate to use the phrase Passover. Now, we're very fortunate, very blessed in Afrikaans when we use the term. We haven't got a term like Easter. Our term is Pasnaviak which points to pass over. So, you know, they might have the bunnies and the eggs and all of those stuff, but the name is okay. So uh, we should just stick to what the name says. It's God's feast. It is not the feast of some other goddess of uh, fertility. And that is very often what is exactly happening. So Passover to us is very, very important. I want you to read with me in the Word of God, and they're from Isaiah, Isaiah 53, verse 7. It's amazing. I want you to keep in mind now, this is the Old Testament, nothing to do with the New, long before Jesus was born. He was oppressed and tormented, but didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb being brought to slaughter, like an ewe silent before a shearers, he did didn't open his mouth. Due to an unjust ruling, he was taken away, and his fate, who will think about it? He was eliminated from the land of the living, struck dead because of my people's rebellion. His grave was among the wicked, his tomb with evildoers, though he had done no violence and had spoken nothing false. You know, they use this portion of scripture to speak to Jews that don't believe in Christ, in Yeshua. And they ask them, do you know where this comes from? Who is it speaking of? You know what they all say? Jesus. That's why we don't believe. And the moment you tell them it's from their own prophet that has been saying this, they are shocked. They can't believe that the Messiah, Jesus, has been explained in the book of Isaiah in the way that it is. Because we all know this is exactly what he went through. It has been foretold. And to me, these kind of things confirm the word of God very clearly. How can we say that some of this is only by accident? Purely coincidence. It's a God instance. That, that prophet received this word so clearly, and he saw what was going to happen to Yeshua, to the Lord, to the Messiah. 
So this scripture, very, very powerful. It just makes us to think. And what gets my attention is grave was among the wicked, his tomb with evildoers. How would they have known that he would have died between two evildoers? That he want, done no violence and had spoken nothing false. And still he was judged to be killed. How amazing is that? Now, I want to speak to you, and we're going to go through the, the, um, the sequence of events, main events that I want to highlight uh, to, and speak of today. The first one is uh, Jesus entering Jerusalem. We're going to look at, at the prophetic and the actual Jesus entering Jerusalem. The second we're going to look at is inspected and questioned by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We're going to see what the process was after he came into Jerusalem. Then we're going to look at the preparation day and him being crucified. Uh, how that fits in with the rest of what we know. And then in the grave for three days and three nights. Very important, not part of three days, three nights. Now, If the expression has been used, then it should be that way. And then we're going to be looking at on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. Now, yes, it looks like a bit of a contradiction because after three days, on the third day, well, we'll see when we get there. So you have an understanding for it. And then, of course, the last one we have is the empty tomb. And if had it not been for the empty tomb, we would not be here today. That's just the reality. So those were the points that we're just going to go through, and I'm not going to linger long on each one of them. The whole idea for this afternoon is to give you the timetable of the sequences or the situations as they have happened uh, through this time of Passover. The first one we look at, of course, is entering Jerusalem, and that happens on the 10th of Nisan. and we find this very important because if there's, if I were to have given you a teaching, which I'm not deliberately going to do going into the fine details, but there are three markers that we always need to look at when we look at the Passover and, and the time frame. The first one is when does it start? The second one would be when is the day of preparation? And the third point is what happened on the first day of the week when they got to the grave and it was empty. Those are our three markers. So if I were to go into a study uh, explaining the whole situation there, I would use those three things to determine what day Yeshua was crucified on. And you, every time, doesn't matter how you look at it, you come to the same conclusion. I was fairly deliberate this time when I prepared the message. I didn't have a look at all my old teaching in terms of this. You know, in a year, you kind of forget, don't you? Uh, Because it is Jewish days and it is our days and all fall on different times. The Jews dawn six to the dawn uh, or rather uh, sunset to sunset. We again from 12 midnight to midnight. So there's a six hour discrepancy between our time slot and the way that the Bible sees it. But don't get confused. (laughs) We don't want you to be confused. We want you to have clarity today, okay? So we'll speak about that. The lamb were brought into Jerusalem on this day of preparation for Passover. On the 10th, the Bible says, the lambs came from, guess where? Bethlehem. Because Bethlehem, just about four or so miles away from uh, Jerusalem, were the place where the shepherds prepared the lambs for Passover. Isn't that amazing? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. He was the Lamb of God, and there he was born in Bethlehem, as with all the other sheep, all the other lambs, for the time of Passover. And then they would come and bring all these lambs that have now been looked after by scholars would have it, the Levites, because they had to look that all look out that these lambs are without 
blemish. They, in other words, all the ones that don't live up to a specific mark was shied away. So they would bro- bring all these beautiful lambs into through the sheep gate into Jerusalem. Now, here's the amazing thing. We find that in Exodus 12, verse 3. He says, tell the whole Israelite community. Now, remember, this is when Jesus spoke about the Passover. Uh, God, rather, speak to Moses about the Passover. He says, tell the whole Israelite community, on the 10th day of this month, Nisan, which is the first month, they must take a lamb for each household, a lamb per house. So what's important about the 10th? That now determines when the cycle starts, the 10th. God is, nowhere else does he mention a number like he does here. This is the beginning of it all, the 10th of Nisan. Bring the sheep in so that they can be inspected is what it was all about. Now listen, Daniel prophesied the entrance of the Messiah, of Jesus. God's lamb into Jerusalem. I want you to get this, just a fun factor. 483 years to the day the scholars have worked it out. How about that? Daniel prophesied that Jesus will come into Jerusalem on that particular day. 483 years before it actually happened. Coincidence? A God instance. It was a proof of, again, what a prophet had said. Amazing so. We find that in Daniel 9.25. Now listen and understand. That means you can make the study. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. If you start working those numbers out, the scholars would, then you get to exactly that day that Jesus came in as the Lamb of God into Jerusalem. I find this fascinating. Uh, I'm, I'm quite analytically minded. So when things make special sense, I'm excited about it. So Daniel prophesied that the people received Jesus as king when he came in. Remember what he did? They threw the palms before him and they started singing Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, That's where the phrase Palm Sunday comes from. But it seems to me it might have been the Saturday. Anyway, we we just let that go for now. (laughs) Listen what the people sang. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So when we sing the song, we're actually singing the song that they have sung in the Psalms and then repeated when Jesus came in. When they said Hosanna to him, they acknowledged him as the king. That Psalm declared him to be the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? They were singing it without realizing the effect of what they were doing. They put the palms down saying that he is the king. Because listen, they knew him for all the miracles that he's done. Now they have this expectation that he will now come to declare himself king and overthrow the Romans and take control again. They had a different view of why Jesus came. But I, we need to use this to have command over the structure that God has given us. In other words, now we know that they received him as king. How did we know that they're going to do it? Zechariah says it. Because he came in on a donkey. And that's how we declared it. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud. And they just did that. They shouted, Hosanna. The king has come. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king, Messianic king, is coming to you, riding on a donkey upon a colt, a fowl of a donkey. And it was not just any donkey. It was the fowl of a donkey that's never been used to be ridden on. That's what Zechariah said. 
And when Jesus came in, he was sat on that fell of the donkey, exactly as it was prophesied. So here's the thing. The Bible said it's going to happen in one way, and it did happen in one way. So Jesus confirmed his stance as the Messiah purely through that occasion or the situation then. The second point we want to highlight, inspected and questioned by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It had to happen. This was part of the Passover ritual uh, because the sheep was checked that it was without blemish. And really for four, nearly five days, they did just exactly that. They looked at it that there would be no problem with this lamb. Uh, because they wouldn't be able to bring an offering to God if there was a blemish. So it had to be perfect. These lambs had to be absolutely perfect. Exodus 12 verse 5 says this, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So it could be a kid or a lamb. Very important again, without blemish. And isn't that exactly what happened? For four days, five days, they checked on these lambs and they couldn't find a problem. So they said, all right, we're going to sacrifice these lambs. They're going to be the offer to God. For five or four or and a bit day, we see that this is exactly what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did with Jesus. They tried to trick him in every possible way, but they just could not find fault in him. Faultless. They eventually had to fabricate false testimonies. And even those that brought their false testimonies didn't see eye to eye. That should have been a sign in itself. There were so many laws that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have uh, trespassed in order for Jesus to be found guilty. But that was not the way they looked at it, but they couldn't find fault in him. So they inspected and questioned him. All along, Jesus taught in the temple courtyard his last days. He was inspected and questioned by, the, by them, even by teachers, without fault. So we see he came in on the right day that the lambs came in. We see that for four days, which is a time it took for them to inspect before the prep, day of preparation for the Passover to check through, they checked Jesus through, and they couldn't find fault with him either. Now, looking at the 10th, which was the Saturday as we would have it. In other words, from the Friday evening to the Saturday evening when the sun went down, that was the 10th of Nisa. He was in there amongst them for the days till the 14th. Listen to what the Bible says to us. The preparation day and the crucifixion, that is the next marker we have. So from the 10th to the 14th. It was a preparation day and he was crucified on the preparation day. I, I'm deliberately making the statement. You'll see how we, we get to exactly that. So when did the preparation day start in the huge Jewish calendar? The evening, as we have it, of the 13th, but it is the 14th, the beginning of the 14th for the due day, because it starts with the night and then goes into the day. So you just got to grasp the idea. It's a little bit different than ours. So the preparation would have started the evening, our time of the 13th, Tuesday afternoon or evening as as it comes tuesday so you've got to listen to the days it's going to be important then the tuesday goes into the wednesday now that wednesday the 14th is the preparation day so we've got the 10th and we've got the 14th that the bible says that we need to hold on to so the 14th is the wednesday our time you see, beginning of the 14th, G Jesus instituted communion. And I want to read that. There's a, quite a uh, controversy is the right way, to, hopefully pronouncing it. But people think 
that the meal, there's a lot of people that think that the meal that Jesus served with the disciples was a Passover meal. But it could not have been because the lamb had not yet been slaughtered. So if whoever listens to the message, you'll see how things pan through, how we very often listen to what people dictate or tell us rather to investigate. And I think that is why we, we come together. Listen to what Luke says, twenty two seventeen. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in other words, when Jesus came together with the disciples on the Tuesday evening, he had a meal instituting communion. All right. Now, some of you would go to the scriptures and you find that Jesus says, go and prepare for us for the Passover. Remember that the day of the Jews begins in the evening. When did they eat? In the evening. So that whole day is a preparation day, the day of Passover. It is not the evening of the next day. It is all of that day is preparation day. So when Jesus sat down, he had the wine and he had the bread and whatever they might have had with a meal. But this was not the Passover meal because the lamb had not been slaughtered. The lamb could only be slaughtered the next day in daylight. Now, I would suggest you go back and make a study of these verses. Don't take my word for it. I'm going to give you the broad uh, backdrop and you build it. Jesus agonized after this now, the meal. The Bible says he agonized when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, of course, we know that Judas came and, and he betrayed him. He uh, brought the disciples or these priests and soldiers uh, came then to arrest Jesus in preparation for the crucifixion. Towards the end, after they have crucified him, put him on the cross, and we're in with a Wednesday. So I'm making statements that have to be clarified as we go along. Wednesday morning, nine o'clock, he was on the cross. 12 o'clock, you know what happened? Darkness fell. And then about three o'clock, roughly, he died. On what day? The day of preparation. Here's the amazing thing. The moment around about three o'clock when he died was also exactly the time that the sheep or the lamb was slaughtered in the temple on behalf of the nation. Absolutely in tune. So when Jesus died, he paid as lamb the price for all of us. While all this happened at the temple for the nation, a lamb was slaughtered. Everything still very finely tuned in happening in, happening in tandem. So it's important. So the crucifixion, according to this guideline or the timeline, was Wednesday. Wednesday. Exodus 12, verse 6. You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month. This is now the lamb that had to be slaughtered. And then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it at when? Dusk. Now, when the, the word dusk is used in the Bible, in, in Hebrew as well as in Greek, it is meant from uh, around about 3 to 6, you know, when the sun begins to, to wane away. That is dusk. We call dusk when it's beginning to get dark. So now he says that is the time that the lambs had to be slaughtered. So when they slaughter it, they now prepare the meal for what? Passover, for the Passover meal that we get also in, in Exodus. We explained exactly how it had to happen. Remember the blood against the posts and then the sheep with the Aesop, the blood smeared, but also that they had certain things that they were to eat. The bread unleavened, nothing of all the fancy stuff 
that we very often see has become tradition. Very stable. Then he goes on to say this. He was forced to carry his cross because he was going towards being crucified. That cross weighed about 70 kilogram, uh, but it wasn't the whole cross. Most scholars would have it that the upright beam was already there waiting and he had to carry the cross part of it on the shoulders. Uh, you can imagine uh, he would never have been able to carry the whole cross. The weight thereof would have been enormous. So the culture was that it was the cross beam that was carried. And you can go and do your research and you'd soon find out that that is the suggestion in, from most scholars. And then, of course, we find that the nails were driven in uh, through his hands. Isaiah 52, and I'll point to it tomorrow exactly how it was done through the hands so that you will know. Isaiah 52, 13 says, and the Lord said, my servant will succeed. He will be given great praise and the highest honor. Many were horrified of what happened to him, but everyone who saw him was even more horrified because he suffered until he no longer looked human. New Testament? No, Isaiah. And that's what the Bible said. If you look at what Jesus has gone through and we speak tomorrow about it, Here's a glimpse that the prophet had of how bad it will be for Jesus, for the Messiah. Coincidence? God pre-warned prophetically. And then we somehow very often can take all these things so lightly, the price that Jesus has paid. We just accept he was crucified, he was resurrected, and we say it in one sentence, and happy we get on with life. We need to begin to understand what he had actually paid in order for us to be experiencing what we have. The next point I want to highlight. In the grave for three days and three nights, and yes, a bone of contention very often, because people have different ideas how to explain all of this. And most of them say it part of days counts for days, but they just cannot account for the third night. And then they say, well, it's just an idiom. But those scholars that know their way around the language says that every time the two phrases are used together, day and night, it goes beyond an idiom. It now is factual. So to belittle it to just that, purely because it needs to fit Friday to Sunday, is taking away from the truth of the word of God. Very clearly so. So now we see that he had died on the Wednesday, on the Wednesday, and not the Friday, two days later. Let's see what the word says to us. This is 72 hours. So day and night means three days and nights adds up to 72 hours. It is a period, it's a time slot, very deliberately so. The lamb for the nation was slaughtered around three o'clock, as I've mentioned to you, same time that Jesus died. He, had removed, he was removed from the cross and buried before the sun went down. Why was that? Because the next day would be a Sabbath. All right, so let's see what the scripture says in John 19 and then verse 31. He says, therefore, because it was preparation day. So Wednesday, the Bible says preparation day. Now, if it's preparation day, it was a time that the lamb was slain. If Jesus had fulfilled all these other prophecies, why would he be crucified on another day than the preparation day? And you cannot move preparation to Friday. It just don't make sense. That means that the animals would have had to be about six to seven days in inspection time. Where does the 14th fit in then? It doesn't make sense. Now listen, he says, therefore, because it was preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high Sabbath. So it wasn't a weekly Sabbath. It was a high Sabbath. 
It was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a high Sabbath, a special Sabbath. So we had to be removed because of this in preparation for the high Sabbath. The sign of being Messiah is that Jesus would be in the grave for three days and three nights. And here's the amazing thing. The Pharisees came to him and they asked him this question. And I, and I wish people would just, as scholars, just stand at this verse and think about it before we make calculations. Matthew 12, 40. For even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster or creature of fish, as some translations would have it, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, when they ask him, how will we know that you are the Messiah? Jesus says, here's the sign. Don't you reckon that's important? He says, if I don't fulfill three days and three nights, I'm not the Messiah. Isn't that what it says? So in other words, when Jesus says three days, three nights, he meant what he said. He says, now you will know. Why do you think that they sent guards to guard the grave, the tomb? Because they were saying to, the, to, to Pilate, they're going to come and steal away, and then they would say that his prophecy were true. But in the meantime, three days, three nights, he said. In other words, the 15th was the high Sabbath. Get this? 10th came into Jerusalem. 14th, day of preparation. How do we know that? Because the Bible says it. 15th, the first day of the unleavened bread, the feast of the unleavened bread. How do we know that? Because the Bible says it. That's the first day. So where does Passover fit in? Passover is the name that we collectively give for this whole season. In other words, from crucifixion, from the beginning of the unleavened bread to the end of the unleavened bread. Because we have three feasts. Passover, first fruit, unleavened bread, all combined in one. So now we know the 15th is the first day of the unleavened bread. People couldn't work because it was Sabbath. Sabbath. So Jesus had to be removed the Wednesday. The Thursday they spent in rest. Now you can just imagine how everybody was tensed up about what is about to happen. And then we see in Mark 16:1. Another important one. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they would go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Get this. When the Sabbath, the high Sabbath, was gone, they then went the next day. If this makes sense to you, get this now. They went the next day to buy spices but let me just jump forward a little bit so that you can get the context of it didn't they say when they came with the spices early in the morning while it was still dark so how did they get to buy the spices and be there before it was light now to us that says it's a different day so in other words the 16th is the day after the high Sabbath, 16th. They got all these spices, now they prepare it. But they're not going to go to the body yet. They've done all their preparation before the weekly Sabbath. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And here's the contradiction that very many people say, how does that work? After three days, on the third day. Well, if we work on a 72-hour cycle, when did, was Jesus buried? Or let me rephrase that. When, was he, when did he die? <laughs> According to the word of God, he died around about three in the afternoon. 
So if you were to work 72 hours out from three forward on, it is round about between three and six on the Sabbath day, the third day that he had risen. I want you to get that. In other words, 72 hours after three days on the third day, he rose. There's no contradiction in the Bible. Matthew 17, verse 22. Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of people. 23, verse 23 says, who will put him to death and on the third day will he be raised. And they were filled with sadness. So he says, after three days, three nights. And yet Jesus says, on the third day. So no one else is coloring the picture except Jesus. So we got to make sense of exactly what Jesus has said. So 72 hours, somewhere in the afternoon, on the Sabbath, Saturday, he was risen. Do you think that Jesus needed the stone to be removed in order to rise? So here's the thing, the tomb is empty. He has risen. The following day on the 18th, let's quickly get the dates in, in sequence again. The 10th, he came in. Four days, he waited to be inspected. The 14th day, he was crucified, the Wednesday. He had to come off the cross quickly because the next day, the 15th, is the start of the feast day, which is a holy Sabbath. They couldn't work, 15. So they went to 16th and they buy their spices in order to do what they do. But they couldn't go the 17th because it was Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. Now the Bible is very clear in, in terms of the translation that there were two Sabbaths that week and I'll give you that scripture. So in other words, now we find out the 17th he was risen after three days on the third day. And then we get, of course, the 18th, which is the Sunday, the first day of the week that people very often says, says this is when he has risen. But you can't say that unless you believe in Friday. But then you can't fit in three nights because there isn't. You cannot do the three days because you can't. Because they came before the day. The day is when the sun rises. Okay, so John 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. When she got there, she now realized the stone is gone. But it was still dark, the Bible says. Before it was day, it was still night. So we couldn't account for that day. Jesus did not need the stone to be rolled away. He could go right through it. But the stone was rolled away for our behalf in order for him to see that the grave is empty. Now, I've made this so that we can just get a rough idea of what we stand for. The first we see Nisan 10, which is the time Jesus have entered on the Saturday. Nisan 11, the Sunday, 12 to Tuesday, as you see at the bottom there, Jesus was inspected and questioned by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But then we also see that he had a meal with the disciples. When did he have that meal with the disciples? Late on Tuesday. Late on Tuesday. Uh, the blue between is the daytime, and then, of course, the two lines either side is uh, hours of darkness in our calendar or days. And then Wednesday, we find that that is the day that he was crucified. 
Jesus crucified around about nine o'clock in the morning. Jesus died around about uh, three o'clock. And Jesus was buried just before six uh, our time. And then Thursday, we know Thursday was a high Sabbath. Now, Jesus was in the grave from where the two red lines are. Jesus in the grave three days, three nights, just before sundown on Wednesday, buried, just before sundown on Saturday, resurrected. And when they came to the tomb early in the darkness on Sunday, Nisan 18, it was empty. So you can see how these days flow one into the other without a discrepancy. To me, the most important thing is what Jesus says, how to identify him as the Messiah. Three days, three nights. If it was any shorter, he could not be the Messiah, according to his own testimony. It's amazing how we think it is all right. The most important event for the Christian is his crucifixion and resurrection. And we don't bother about it. Making sure that he is the Messiah. And you think we are going into too much detail. <coughs> Let me tell you, the enemy are going into much more detail to try and mislead rather than to build up. You don't need to be a scholar to understand this. The three things I mentioned to you in terms of what the Holy Spirit has showed me and how I didn't look at what others said, purely because I want to know from the word of God. Of course, we use other scholars to, uh, to bring clarity to it. But to me, it was very important. What is the first date that we know? The 10th is the day that Jesus, God said Passover would begin. That date is unchangeable. The second date, unchangeable, is the day of preparation when the lamb is to be slaughtered, which was the 14th. So now we've got two dates that make sense. But how long was Jesus in the grave? Well, the next point we need is we know it can't be on a Sunday. So once you determine it can't be on a Sunday and you know when Jesus had been buried, you need to move three days from where he was buried. Or what I did was I worked three days back from the Sunday, which it wasn't. And then get got to the Wednesday. Coming to the Wednesday, everything fell in place. So why is it that we sometimes celebrate the Tuesday evening when Jesus says, go and uh, prepare for the uh, Passover? And people use all those scriptures to say it was the Passover meal. Passover is a meal. There's no day Passover. It is what the meal is called. And that meal consists of the lamb. That's the most important part, the lamb for that day. That's Passover. And Passover, in terms of the original setting in place, the only other thing that was in common there was the unleavened bread. But you go back to the scripture, you don't find the wine there. Because we've got to go back in the word, don't we? To see what the root is. There's no, there was no wine there. So when Jesus came with the Passover, and it doesn't matter how clever we want to get, most of the traditions that we have, and even the Jews have today, is tradition man-made. Let's get back to the word of God. See what the Bible is saying. And listen, I've always maintained this. If I'm wrong, and you can prove me wrong, I will listen. I'm not, there's no pride there. We want to be right. Praise the Lord. Amen. We want to be right. Not in the sense that we want to take it. It is God. So we need to pay attention to what the Bible says. So the meal that Jesus and the disciples had, had was for one particular reason. Communion. Communion. Not Passover. That meal he now became. When his body was broken 
and his blood was shed that follow evening. Isn't that amazing? There's no coincidences in the word of God. Everything, when we begin to lose the things that we've been taught, and we get back to the word of God, things begin to look differently. So I want to invite you. We'll have the notes on with the M59. So if you want to go through those notes, you're more than welcome to do so. We've recorded the, it so you could pause, run, pause, run, and check the things that I've said so that you can have certainty in your own heart. Jesus crucified on the Wednesday. Now the question was this, because I made a statement through on M59 in terms of uh, the days. I'm referring, when we speak about when Jesus was crucified, we're speaking about the history, when it actually happened. Now next year, we might have that, uh, because of the way the calendar falls, that Nissan 10, or 14 rather, further on, could be Sunday. So that would be the real date to celebrate. This is why our high Sabbath move on with the calendar. So all of this just points to that one occasion when it actually happened. All right, so there, there are no misunderstandings. We make the point between history and now, and then we, we take it from there. You've been blessed? I've been blessed. I on, honestly, in terms of my preparation, I said to Pietro, because I had to start all over again, because I wanted to have in my own mind. I was sat on my desk with a piece of paper and a pen in one of those, Pietro bought me one of those pens that had the four colors, you see. So I would scratch with my blue one and then switch over to red without taking out a pen. It's not a miracle, it's one pen. <laughs> and all of a sudden my pen starts writing in green oh. or blue or red. And then mark out the Jewish or God's calendar in the sense that it starts six to six. And then just below that start off my, the Gregorian ca calendar, our days, so that I could make sense of how many days and at what day that we end up. So be blessed. He was in the grave for three days, three nights. He arose on the third day. And the stone was rolled away purely to show those coming that he has actually risen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's just bow our heads as we pray. Father, we just want to thank you that we've had the privilege of just being able to assimilate your word. Lord, there's actually so much to be said, but we wanted to lay the foundation. And I pray, Father, there'll be a hunger in our hearts to do our own research. For Lord, it is so important to understand that when Jesus said three days, three nights, he meant it. When he pointed to Jonah, Lord, for a reason, to say what has happened then is also going to happen with me. And, and this would prove that I am the Messiah. And we declare this day, Lord, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he has risen. And Maranatha, he will come back again. And we are excited to await that time. But, Lord, we also know that time is going to get more tough as we continue in awaiting your coming back. But I thank you also, Lord, that as we stand on the truth of your word, you will establish us, Lord, into your protection. And for that, we are grateful. And now, Lord, I pray for the holy word to have fallen into our hearts, this ordained word, Lord, so that we might have it as food, but also, Lord, to be built up against whatever the enemy have to come against us. We pray this in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, in his name. Yeshua. Sure.